Welcome all of you. My name is Penny Wright and um, uh, we're just delighted to have you all here this evening. Um, about one year exactly ago, we've had the pleasure of, of meeting Donovan Moore and um, realizing that he was a, a part-time resident of Watermill and uh, got a hold of his book, which I loved and many others loved. And we're really happy to have him here tonight with us. Um, I want to mention that um, at the library, we have quite a bit going on. And for those of you, because there are quite a few here tonight, for those of you who may want to have access to our programs or our newsletter or our emails we send once a week, just write an email to info at myrml.org. Info at my RML for Rogers Memorial Library.org, and we'll add you to our list of uh, people who we send uh, information to. Uh, we are particularly uh, happy tonight to have the participation of 15 libraries who are interested in, in Donovan Moore's book and of being a part of tonight. And I want to just mention those libraries. Um, and, and some representatives are here, so thank you all for coming the Deer Park Public Library, the Cutchog New Suffolk Library, Southhold Free Library, Hampton Bays Public Library, the West Hampton Free Library, the Hampton Library in Bridgehampton, the Shelter Island Public Library, the John Germain Library in Sag Harbor, Quag Library, Port Jefferson Library, Mattituck Library, Riverhead Library, and the Floyd Memorial Library in Greenport. Thank you all for uh, being a part of tonight. We're, we're really happy to have you here. Um, I know some of you know Donovan Moore, but many do not. And I'll tell you a couple of quick things about him. Uh, he a number of newspapers and magazines, including the Boston Globe, for which he at one point wrote a bi-monthly column for the Sunday Magazine, uh, Rolling Stone. He's also worked as a television reporter and producer I believe he was the first producer hired for uh, 2020 uh, at, right. at ABC News. Is that correct, Donovan? I overheard uh, someone saying that. Um, and he also worked as a private banker. So he holds an undergraduate degree from, uh, in mathematics from Duke and an MS from the Sloan School of Management at MIT. Um, he and his wife, Anne, who is here this evening, uh, are the proud new grandparents, I am told, of a little grandson. So congratulations to both of you. And Donovan, it's a pleasure to have you here. So we're all going to welcome you, even though, we, even though we're all going to be muted and we can't clap right now, but uh, we welcome you here this evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And thank you, Pat. <clears throat> and thank you, both of you, for organizing uh, this group to join the Rogers Library and the Southampton History Museum, I believe. Um, it's quite a feat stringing all these participants together, so I really do appreciate it. And thank you all for tuning in. This was, um, this was supposed to be an on-site event at the library, um, which of course is not happening now, but um, these video presentations actually work pretty well, I think. Um, I read recently that um, when you're in quarantine, um, it's good to find ways to interact. You feel better when you participate. So I would encourage you as I go through this presentation, if you have a question, write it in the, I believe there's a chat box or write it down yourself so that you can then um, ask it afterwards. We'll do a, we'll do a brief Q and A at the end. Okay, so with that in mind, grab your wine. I've got mine. And let's get started. So let me share my screen now. And I'm not sure whether you have me spotlighted, um, Pat, but if, um, if people put their uh, Zooms on speaker mode, I think, you, and the slides will come up nice and big, um, they're much more interesting than I am. And I think you're going to want to see them. OK. <clears throat> So whenever I tell someone, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've written a book, 
a biography of a woman scientist, the first question without fail is, how did you get that idea? And I'll bet that's what most of you are thinking right now. So let me tell you. Years ago, before I sold out to Wall Street, I used to write, as Penny said, Boston Globe, Rolling Stone, newspaper and magazine pieces, mostly. Now and then an occasional screenplay, and they were all purchased. None of them were made. None of them was made, but they were all bought. Very frustrating. But what I always wanted to write was a book. So in the spring of 2016, I took a friend, Lanny Jones, to lunch. Lanny was the at the time, the retired managing editor of People Magazine. And he had written a biography and I wanted to talk to him about the isolation research, how you deal with it, things like that. Lanny knew I had an interest in science and technology and he also knew I wanted to write a book. So he said he would send me the materials from a course he was auditing at Princeton called The Universe. So he did. And as I was leaping through it, see if I can get this to turn here, there we go. As I was reading through it, I came upon a page with three photographs, <clears throat> no names, just three photos. I recognized the two men, Aristotle and Newton. Who's the woman literally on the same page as these eminent scientists? It was, of course, Cecilia Payne. I was intrigued, so I started to poke around. First, there was that photograph. It wasn't a picture of Cecilia herself. It was of her oil portrait. Patricia Watwood, an American portraitist, had painted it from a montage of 25 separate photos. She had based it on The Astronomer, a 1668 Vermeer oil on canvas that hangs today in the Louvre. The portrait was commissioned in 2002 by Dudley Hirschbach. He's a Nobel winning professor of chemistry at Harvard and his wife, Georgine. I'll tell you more about this in a few minutes. At the dedication ceremony for the portrait, Jeremy Knowles, Dean of the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences, uh, spoke, and this is what he said. Every high school student knows that Newton discovered gravity, that Darwin discovered evolution, even that Einstein discovered relativity. But when it comes to the composition of our universe, the textbooks simply say that the most prevalent element in the universe is hydrogen, and no one ever wonders how we know. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. I kept poking, and what I found was this amazingly inspirational story of a woman who had to overcome unbelievable obstacles, personal, academic, professional, to make one of the most fundamental discoveries in all of science, and no one had written a book about her. I had my idea. So I retired from private banking. I actually hate that word. I like to say I changed jobs, and I started to research. I read Cecilia's memoir, I traveled to Cambridge, England, where I rode a bicycle all over the university, day and night, because I wanted to know what it was like for Cecilia back in the 1920s. And I studied old photographs. Cecilia was born in 1900 in Wendover, a small British village 40 miles northwest of London. Her father, Edward, died when she was only four years old. She was raised by her mother, Emma. And early on, she had a relentless curiosity. That's Cecilia on the right with her brother and sister. When she won a botany contest, she got to choose any book she wanted, which then would be bound in leather. The school of, uh, expected her, of course, to choose Shakespeare or maybe Milton. She chose a book on fungi. She had little patience for organized religion. She once asked a London bookbinder to put a fake cover on the apology and inscribe Holy Bible on the spine so that her teachers would think she was working on her religion studies instead of reading Plato. The bookbinder refused to do it. It was an attitude that finally got her expelled at 16, with just one year of school left before college. Most girls at the time went to finishing school to get prepared for marriage. Luckily for Cecilia and for science, she was accepted to St. Paul's School for Girls in London. This was no finishing school. It was serious, and it was a school made for her. The minute she walked in the door, she said to herself, I shall never be lonely again. Now I can think about science. <clears throat> Her goal was to go to Cambridge University, so she spent that last year studying all the time. Newtonian equations of motion, thermodynamics, astronomy. It was a wild year, and she did it. She was accepted to Cambridge on a scholarship in the fall of 1919. Now, Cambridge had been, for 700 years, strictly all men. In 1865, when women started making noises about going to Cambridge, a geology professor at the time pronounced them to be Nasty, forward minxes. 
It was not until 1871 that women were finally accepted to the university. When Cecilia, neither nasty nor a minx, but definitely forward, enrolled, she was a freshman at Newnham, one of two colleges for women at Cambridge. It was understood at the time that men studied mathematics, women majored in botany. So she dutifully checked the botany box with physics as a minor. Now everything changed though after only a few months when this man came back into town. His name is Arthur Eddington. With his starched collar, his perfectly knotted silk tie, the pince-nez, the hint of a smile, he looked like he knew more about what you were going to say than you did. He was supremely confident. This is how he opened chapter 11 of his book, Philosophy of Physical Science. I believe there are, whatever that number is, protons in the universe and the same number of electrons. I mean, how do you argue with that, right? Eddington was director of the Cambridge Observatory and he had just returned from Principe off the coast of West Africa. He had gone there in May of 1919 to demonstrate the validity of Einstein's theory of relativity by photographing a solar eclipse. You'll have to read the book to get the details, but suffice to say, he did it. The New York Times, on short notice, assigned the coverage to Henry Crouch, the, new, the paper's golf reporter. It was said at the time that Henry would have been the first to admit that he was not an authority on the mathematics of four-dimensional space-time. But Henry did perceive that something extraordinary had taken place. Eddington came back to Cambridge in December of that year to give a lecture on the results of his solar expedition. Now I put this slide in to show you the scale of things at Cambridge. This is the entrance to the dining hall at Trinity College. People apparently were much shorter back then. So Eddington strides into the Trinity dining hall to give his lecture, and it was all anyone could talk about. By anyone, I mean men. There were only four women in the audience. One of the original four couldn't go, so she gave her ticket to Cecilia. That woman, lost to history, could not have foreseen that it would mark a turning point in Cecilia's life. After Eddington finished, she raced back to her dorm and transcribed the lecture word for word into a notebook. She recalled at the time, for three nights, I think I did not sleep. My world had been so shaken that I experienced something like a nervous breakdown. She was done with botany. She switched her major to physics with all the astronomy she could pick up on the side. Now, physics was taught at the time at the, time, at the famed Cavendish Laboratory. To study physics back then, you had to use your hands to work with glass tubes and wires and electrical coils. At Cambridge, however, mathematics ruled and mathematicians worked with their minds. They decidedly did not work with their hands. So physicists at Cambridge had to disguise where they worked, and often the best place to hide something is right in plain sight. Thus, the Cavendish lab, the birthplace of modern physics, where scientists ultimately would conduct experiments in nuclear fission, was not located somewhere out in the countryside, but right in the middle of town, behind a Gothic entrance with 18-inch walls, and where the window boxes held not flowers, but helioscopes that drove sunlight into the lab. To get to the lab from Newnham, Cecilia had to have two things, a bicycle and a hat. Before a woman could enter the center of town, she had to have her head covered. I don't have a picture of Cecilia then, you'll just have to imagine a young woman on a bike in Edwardian dress, wearing the required hat, and avoiding horse droppings as she crossed the River Cam on a cold winter morning. Now, physics was taught in the Maxwell Lecture Theater, a cavernous room with 28-foot ceiling and wooden plank floors. Because Cecilia was a woman, the only woman in a class of 30, she had to sit in the front row. The physics professor was also the head of the lab, Ernest Rutherford. Before he became a physicist, he won the 1908 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. He would gaze directly at Cecilia and begin each lecture with, ladies and gentlemen. Cecilia would remember that all the boys regularly greeted this witticism with thunderous applause, stamping with their feet in the traditional manner, and at every lecture I wished I could sink into the earth. When she wasn't at the cab lab, she could be found in an observatory. First she discovered the little one out back of her dorm, the Newnham Observatory. Now, I took this picture so I can tell you it is literally just a little hut with a, with a telescope inside. 
She snuck out one night, opened the hatch, fixed the clock that kept the telescope aimed correctly, and then installed a notebook with instructions that observers had to record their findings with a signature and a date. Her closest friend at Newnham, another freshman named Betty Leaf, wrote in the school newspaper that Cecilia was now to be found on starry nights among the moths and dust of Newnham Observatory, showing the wonders of the heavens to all who come. There was, of course, another observatory, the Cambridge Observatory. It was a 10 minute bicycle ride away. When it was open to the public, Cecilia would bike there at night. It was very safe. This was Cambridge University. No one gave a second look to a young woman in Edwardian dress pedaling hard up Mattingly Road. This is what it looked like then. This is what it looks like today. Nothing much has changed. Now this observatory had a considerably bigger telescope. It was known as the Sheepshanks Telescope, a 12 and a half inch refractor. One night, she asked so many penetrating questions that the assistant, poor little Henry Green, ran out of the observatory, scurried into the main building, and told the director that he needed help. Sir, he said, there's a woman out there asking questions. The sir he was referring to was Arthur Eddington. When Eddington walked over to the telescope, Cecilia wasted no time in telling him that she wished to be an astronomer. His rather laconic response was, I see no insuperable objection. When she later said the same thing to F.J.M. Stratton, a lecturer in astrophysics, his response was, you can never hope to be anything but an amateur. Cecilia endured these kinds of comments, endured derision in the classroom because of the timing. She was learning physics from the very scientists, Rutherford, Eddington, Niels Bohr, who were making great discoveries. As her friend Betty Leaf put it, she is most completely happy when some beautiful mathematical theory of the universe makes her forget the minor disturbances of everyday life. As Cecilia's four years at Cambridge wound down, she had to figure out what to do upon graduating. She got help from this man, Leslie L.J. Comrie. He was a character. He lost a leg in World War I, yet still played a mean game of tennis. He was an expert in computational astronomy, of whom it was said that he did not make allowances for the frailties of others and was far from tactful in pointing them out. He was a demanding mentor to Cecilia. Under his guidance, she assembled her own personal set of mathematical tables. And it was LJ who took her to the British Astronomical Association in London as his guide to listen to, listen to a lecture given by Harlow Shapley, the director of the Harvard College Observatory. Afterwards, Cecilia went back to her dorm, and as she had done after listening to Eddington, transcribed Chapley's lecture into a notebook, word for word. With absolutely no prospects for an astronomy job in England, she began a handwritten correspondent with Chapley. I think somebody uh, is, needs to mute their microphone. I'll keep going, though. First, a heartfelt letter seeking a job at the Harvard Observatory, followed by when Shapley expressed interest, her qualifications. And it worked. She got Shapley to offer her a fellowship for a year's work at Harvard. She packed her clothes in a trunk and boarded a canard liner bound for the United States. She put a snapshot of her friend Betty Leaf in her wallet. Now what's happening here is this. Physics as a form of scientific study is emerging and physics was now being combined with other disciplines to make great discoveries. Rutherford was fusing physics with chemistry to understand the nucleus of an atom. Bohr was fusing physics with the quantum theory to study molecular structure. Einstein was fusing physics with mathematics to produce his theory of relativity. So, so might young woman graduate student Cecilia Payne be able to fuse physics with astronomy to understand the known universe, to determine what stars are made of? Okay, so for the two or three of you out there who don't know the answer, let's find out. I must confess that in Massachusetts, I have found a stony-hearted stepmother. That's how Cecilia described where she had landed in the fall of 1923. The Harvard College Observatory was located on Concord Avenue at the northwest edge of the campus. High up on a hill, its windows glowing deep into the night, it was unlike any other building. Cecilia's daughter remembers it had a spookily delightful spiral staircase, a creaky dumbwaiter, and a dusty catacomb. 
A number of women were employed at the observatory before Cecilia got there. Wilhelmina Fleming, Antonio Mari, Andy Jump Cannon, Henrietta Leavitt. They were known as computers, and their job was to observe and catalog every star that the observatory's telescope could find. They did an amazing job. They produced nine 250-page volumes of stellar classifications. Cecilia knew just two of them. She would work late at night with Antonio Mari, that's her in the upper right, who insisted on keeping the windows open so that the two of them were bitten unmercifully by mosquitoes, and Annie Cannon, lower left, who could classify spectra at the astonishing rate of 350 stars every hour. They didn't do it all alone, however. There were a number of assistants with their own idiosyncrasies. There was Louisa Wells, who Cecilia remembered as sitting at her desk, marking stars on a glass plate, and then falling asleep and rubbing all the marks off with her nose. And Edward King, who admonished Cecilia to never record the time of ending an exposure until the shutter had actually been closed, one might die in the interval and the record would then be inaccurate. There are so many oddball characters in this, in this story, I can only touch on a handful of them. But that's all the computers did, classify. They didn't try to analyze or understand. It's like they stocked a library with hundreds of thousands of books and then didn't read any of them. There were two reasons. First, that wasn't their job. But second, none of the computers had been trained in physics and in astronomy as Cecilia had been. They just collected specimens, that's all. They were a quirky bunch of characters, but to Cecilia, far from her mother, far from her brother and sister, far from home, they soon became like family. Now it was time to put all her Cavendish lab learning to work. First stop was the office of Harlow Shapley, the director of the observatory and the man who hired her. Shapley thought he was getting another hardworking computer. He was wrong. She reminded him that she was on a fellowship. She was technically not an employee. Shapley then asked, well, what did she want to do? All those stellar spectra on glass plates, they were like a million jigsaw puzzle pieces waiting for someone to put them together. She said she wanted to focus her Cavendish lab training on what was, on what was stored away in those dusty catacombs. In other words, introduce astrophysics to the Harvard College Observatory. Shapley may not have been able to dictate what Cecilia would do on her fellowship, but he was a smart man. The observatory had always been more or less an outpost. He was determined to create a true department of astronomy at Harvard. But to do that, he would need a doctoral candidate. He told Cecilia that she could have her run of the place. All she had to do was write a thesis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ne neither of them knew at the time what a momentous thing that would turn out to be. So Cecilia now turned her trained eye on all those glass plates. At first, she described them as little more than tiny parallel smears. How was she supposed to apply astrophysics to smears? Another obstacle, which is exactly when the smears started to make sense. Now, you and I can't see it, but she could. Silicon first, then carbon. She could see a relationship between ionization levels and temperature. Finally, she wrote, some light dawned in the darkness. <clears throat> but as she worked her way down the periodic table, she could see that stars were composed mostly of hydrogen, like a million times more hydrogen than the astronomical community had assumed. It was heresy. From Eddington on down, the established men of science believed that stars were composed of the same elements as Earth and in roughly the same proportion. Heated up Earths, if you will. <clears throat> These are two of the established men. Shapley on the right and Henry Norris Russell on the left. Russell was the director of the Princeton Observatory and the Dean of American Astronomers. When he read a draft of Cecilia's thesis, he felt compelled to warn her. There is something seriously wrong with the present theory, he wrote to Cecilia. It is clearly impossible that hydrogen should be a million times more abundant than the metals. She was cornered now. In order to get her thesis, Stellar Atmospheres, published as demanded by Shapley, she had to accommodate Russell. So she hedged. She described her conclusion that hydrogen dominated the composition of stars as almost certainly not real. Almost certainly. As historian David Dvorkin described it, she was crafty, choosing her words in a manner that was designed to record that for, for prospect posterity that she was the first to make this observation, right or wrong. In so doing, pain can be credited with profound political acumen. 
She always regretted it, is what Cecilia's daughter Catherine told me in an interview, talking about Cecilia's decision to deny the results of her research. She didn't dwell on it, Catherine said, but throughout her life, she lamented that decision. Now, of course, in hindsight, it's clear that Cecilia, looking down at those slides, had done what astronomers had tried to do for centuries by looking up, determine what stars are made of, one of the most fundamental of all scientific discoveries. Her findings were dismissed because the veteran astronomers at the time did not have the same training in physics that she had. In other words, they could not peer as deeply into the universe as she could. With the thesis complete, Cecilia could finally come up for air, live a little, as she put it. Her best friend at the observatory was Adelaide Ames, another young researcher. They were so close they came to be known as the Heavenly Twins. Adelaide worked as Shapley's assistant. She was very much under his thumb and unavailable. So when Cecilia decided to drive cross country, she took her roommate along, Frances Wright. That's her in the center. They took Cecilia's car. She had saved up enough money to buy a 1930 Model T. Around this time, Cecilia crossed paths with this man, Norbert Wiener. Norbert would become a mathematics professor at MIT. He was known for stopping in on fellow professors, knocking off his cigar ashes in the blackboard chalk tray, and then asking which way had he come in. When he got the answer, he would say, oh good, that means I've had lunch. He and Cecilia met on board ship during one of Cecilia's trips back to England. 31-year-old Norbert fell madly in love with 25-year-old Cecilia. He wrote to his mother, as you know, we are going back on the same boat. A lot can happen on a boat. Poor Norbert, a lot didn't happen. The more he pressed, the more Cecilia backed away. She was living in America now. She was going to have a career as a scientist and not just be the supportive wife of an irrepressible professor. Meanwhile, there was a crack in the wall of belief that earthly metals were the principal elements of stars. Four years after Cecilia's thesis was published, Norris Russell, the man who told her she was wrong, finally concluded that hydrogen is far more abundant than the other metals. His research agreed with Cecilia's, but he buried that fact toward the end of the paper he published. He got the credit at the time because, as historian David Dvorkin puts it, he knew what the community would accept. Cecilia was teaching astronomy courses now, although her name was not listed in the Harvard course catalog. She did have her own apartment, but her salary was regrettable. She was paid out of Shapley's equipment budget. But the steadiness was tempered by sadness. Ten years after arriving at Harvard, she learned that her close friend at Cambridge, Betty Leaf, had drowned. She would not be the only one. Adelaide had been on a lake when a storm tossed her canoe uh, tossed her out of a canoe. She soon disappeared. Shapley himself took charge of the search. It took 10 days to recover the body. Cecilia was devastated. Adelaide and Betty were dead and I was alive, she wrote later. I was absorbed in my work, shy and unattractive. I made a silent resolve I would embrace life. She needed to get away, away from the U.S., away from the observatory. She didn't do what probably you and I would do in the dead of winter, go to a beach somewhere. Instead, she went first to Polkovo, a remote observatory on the outskirts of St. Petersburg in Russia, and then by train to Lower Saxony in Germany for a meeting of the German Astronomical Society. As she was sitting in the back of the auditorium, a conference official with a bundle of mail in his arms walked by calling out, Miss Payne, Miss Payne. After she identified herself, a young man approached. His name was Sergei Gabashkin. He was there to meet the renowned American astronomer, Cecilia Payne, and he was obviously taken aback. Because of her reputation, Cecilia later recalled he had expected that Miss Payne would be a little old lady and was surprised to find her no older than himself. Sergei told her that he was a Russian astronomer in Berlin. He couldn't stay in Germany and he couldn't return to Russia. He gave her a handwritten account of his life and asked, could she help him? On the train back to Cambridge, August 12, 1933, she took out paper and pen and wrote a six-page letter to Shapley about Sergei. It was classic Cecilia, detailed, thorough, organized. There was also something else, something missing from her other correspondence. It was emotional. I am not ashamed to confess that I literally passed a sleepless night after my first talk with him. He came from Berlin to Göttingen on his bicycle four days journey. 
carrying his provisions with him. I shall long remember how we walked up the main street, Gabashkin nervously giving the salute to passing brown shirts. He is small but strong and of a happy exclamation point disposition. Forgive me if I speak strongly, it is not a rash impulse and it comes from the heart. She traveled to Washington to push for a visa for Sergei. She pressured Shapley to hire him. She was typically relentless. It worked. By December, Sergei had his own desk at the Harvard Observatory. And three months later, they slipped away to New York, where, as Cecilia described it, in March 1934, I became Cecilia Payne Gaboshkin. Their disappearance in marriage was a surprise to the astronomical community. One story, undoubtedly a myth, was that upon hearing the news, Annie Cannon fainted dead away. It was Henry Norris Russell, though, who best captured the mood. I sincerely hope that it turns out splendidly, he wrote in a letter, but I keep wondering how it happened. As the years went by, there were changes in Cecilia's life. One was that she and Sergei had children, three altogether. Some things, though, did not change. Although she taught many astronomy classes, she remained relatively anonymous. It was Shapley who told her why. Abbott Lawrence Lowell, the president of Harvard, had told him years earlier that because she was a woman, Miss Payne should never have a position in the university as long as he was alive. Another change came in 1954. Donald Menzel replaced Harlow Shapley as director of the Harvard Observatory. One of the first things he did was to double Cecilia's salary. And with Lowell no longer president of the university, he made another change. The New York Times, June 21, 1956. Harvard University announced today the appointment of Dr. Cecilia Payne Gaboshkin as professor of astronomy. She is the first woman to attain full professorship at Harvard through regular faculty promotion. About her appointment, Cecilia wrote later, I have reached a height that I should never in my wildest dreams have predicted 50 years ago. Sadly, one of the things that did not change in all those years was Cecilia's smoking habit. Harvard professor Owen Gingrich, a student of Cecilia's, described it best. A pack of cigarettes and a single match could get her through the entire period. It caught up with her finally. Cecilia died of lung cancer in December 1979. And in searching for an ending quote to describe this woman who, so, who was so captivated by this simple thrill of discovery, I thought the best was a bit of advice she once gave. She was talking to students who were considering science, but her words apply to everyone who feels the need to understand. Do not undertake a scientific career in quest of fame or money. There are easier and better ways to reach them. Undertake it only if nothing else will satisfy you, for nothing else is probably what you will receive. Your reward will be the widening of the horizon as you climb, and if you achieve that reward, you will ask no other. Okay, now, as promised, back to that portrait. The portrait hangs in University Hall, which means that Cecilia's presence is in the room today for many an important meeting at Harvard. University Hall contains portraits of a number of important figures in the university's history. Here's another one. Abbott Lawrence Lowell, the 22nd president of Harvard University, the same man who once said that Cecilia Payne should never have a position in the university as long as he was alive. Surely Cecilia would appreciate the irony. Her eyes are looking left and slightly up, meaning she now gazes at him on that very same wall, no more than 30 feet away. Okay, that's it. Thank you all for paying attention. And I will stop sharing now. Oh, I'll come back to that slide. Okay, here we go. Donovan, could I make a suggestion? Yes. I, okay, I'd like to suggest that our, part, our, our patrons, our guests, unmute themselves maybe. And if, if they'd like to be seen, that would be nice that we could see a few faces. And so I know some of you have some questions, so it would be a, a good time to ask them. And... Um, so we could start with a little question period, if you don't mind. Sure. <clears throat> okay. Um, if you could raise your hand if you have a question or just indicate it. 
with the virtual feature? I don't want to see. Where is the? You know, what, what writers usually say at this point is, you know, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, what I will say is, if there are any questions I can answer, I'll be happy. So, well, have Donovan, to... I have a question if, if while we're waiting for other people to formulate their questions. And, sure. and it's just something I've thought about after I read this book, um, having really studied Cecilia's life for such a long period of time and read her letters and read her memoir and talked to people who knew her. Um, what was it like? Did you, did you feel that you actually had a personal connection to her at all? I mean, was it, did you wish that you had known her? What kind of a feeling was that to write so deeply about someone and to yeah. think about them for such a long time? Yeah. You know, um, when you write any biography, you dig deeply into that person. And there is, there comes a moment when I, I kind of know her now. In fact, I had, I had uh, Harvard, Harvard University Press is the publisher and Harvard Press is an academic publisher. So they are very meticulous about fact checking and making sure that the science is rigorous and the history is accurate. And I had a couple of little minor battles with Harvard because there were times when having studied her so closely, I knew what was going on at a certain particular time. I wasn't there, obviously, but when I, when I say in the prologue of the book, she stubbed out the last of the pack of cigarettes. She did. I know she did because <laughs> I, I, I know how much she smoked. I talked to people who were actually there and watched her. And so Harvard would say, well, no, wait, you, see, you, you weren't witness. I said, no, I wasn't witnessing, but here's, here's my research and here's why I know that's right. So um, yes, you draw so close that you, you absolutely do know. Now there were times when Harvard pushed back and I said, okay, I, I'm, I'll give on that one. But right. as, you, as you research, you, you get to know so well that you just, even though you weren't there, you know what took place. Right. So interesting. Good, good question, though. Do we have other questions or comments? I have a question. Okay. Um, she was the first woman professor through academic promotion. Correct. Was there some other women professors before that? Yes, I think, I think um, she was the first one to be promoted from within Harvard. I think that there was an, another professor or two who came from outside the university, but she was the first, uh, she's generally considered the first woman professor at Harvard because that's how, that's how it's described. And that's normally the, the course of events as you work your way up. But um, yes, I believe there were, um, there was another a woman professor at Harvard, not from within the university system. Thank you. The, the book was great, very readable. Great, thank you. Hi, Donovan, this is Grant Schneider, and I'm, I'm wondering that it ever occurred to you the irony that she had so many obstacles facing her, and the book launch was facing the obstacle of <laughs> days after this COVID arrived. Yeah. And I wonder if that had hit you in any way, knowing her so well. Yeah, not quite on the same plane, but you're right. You know, we had uh, we had a whole bunch of book tour events planned and uh, astronomical societies, observatories. There, they did not happen. But these videos, you know, I actually think they work pretty well. As somebody, I did one for the Harvard Bookstore uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the woman moderator there, she said, you know, they work because everybody has the same really good seat. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So that so that's good, and also I think, I think there's a there's an evergreen uh, quality to the book, and so uh, my sense is when the virus fog finally lifts, which it will at some point, we'll probably go back and do some live events. All right, well, Donovan, here's the deal. Um, Anne Moore is an exceptional storyteller, and you're giving her a run for the money. So congratulations <laughs> on the great story you. Yeah, yeah, we put Anne on permanent mute here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, thanks, Grant. Grant's a good pal, as you can imagine. Donovan, could you comment a little bit on her children? Yes. Um, uh, she had three, one of whom has passed away. Peter passed away a, year, a couple years ago. Um, another son named Edward, known as Mike. Um, and believe it or not, um, uh, he has a daughter named Cecilia Payne. No, Cecilia Gaboshkin, sorry, because he was a Gaboshkin. Mm. And um, so she is the granddaughter of Cecilia, and she's a professor at Dartmouth, and uh, we've been in touch. And uh, she has read the book. She uh, <clears throat> was on the uh, Harvard Bookstore video, and we're, we're, be, we're making plans to do a joint presentation sometime. I, I thought that would be really kind of cool, the biographer yeah. and, the, and the grandchild. Right. So uh, I think we're going to do it at Dartmouth. I'm, I'm not sure when, but it's in the works. Um, her daughter, the uh, third child, is Catherine. Catherine Harriman Donis is her name. Catherine was just terrific. Uh, she's, she's still alive. And uh, uh, she shared with me all the old photographs that are in the book. She shared with me her uh, memories of her mother. Um, she was just wonderful. And um, the, the photographs really add so much to the text that yeah. I was very appreciative of that. Yeah. Do we have other questions or comments? I'm sure we do here, I hope. I see something in the chat box. It's... I don't see the chat box. Yeah, let, me, let me click on it and see. If... Hi. There seems to be another book that came out the same time as yours by a Sarah Allen. Yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a young adult book, a kid's book. Um, but it has exactly the same title. Yes, <laughs> what's yes. Ours it came out in March, yeah. Yeah, which... yeah. yeah, I didn't know it until uh, uh, the book was on Amazon. So of course I went to Amazon to see, you know, who's saying what, and there's this other book. I went, oh my God. <laughs> um, I've not been in touch with her nor her with me. And I don't, Harvard didn't know it either. Um, it happens. It's, they're very different, but it is about yes. Cecilia Payne and it is yes. a, it's a, it's a children's, children's. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me see what's in this. Maybe I can see what's in this chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please mute your microphones. Okay. Okay, anyone else with a question? I, I sort of have a good Yes, Maureen. <laughs> I was just wondering what you think of the current sort, you, you write of a time when science was so well respected and revered, what you make of the current pseudoscience, anti-science, yeah. and if there's any cure for it. Yeah, gosh, I have no idea what, what you're talking about, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, know, you know, what's interesting is that that sort of hints at something else. And that is, what, what did I learn by writing this book? Um, and what, what I learned, and this, this gets to your question, is be careful what you assume. Um, people back in the 1920s uh, just assumed that this young 25-year-old woman graduate student could not possibly make such a fundamental discovery. I mean, she was a, you know, a graduate student, a woman graduate student. She couldn't do it. And the reason that they did that, the, these so-called established men of science, I call them, is that they were not trained like she was. She learned at the feet of Arthur Eddington and Niels Bohr and Ernest Rutherford. She learned physics from the very men who were making great discoveries at the time. And she was able to take that learning and apply it to astronomy. So what that means is, as I said in the presentation, she, she could peer deeper into the universe than the, these men could. And so she did what centuries of astronomers had tried to do. They, they were looking up through telescopes. It turns out they were looking the wrong way. They should have been looking down like she was at glass plates with starlight etched into them and applying physics. And that's what she used to make her discovery. So, you know, people always are making comments. Um, 
seems like the president of Harvard, no matter who he is, makes comments sometimes that he probably shouldn't. But they remember the, the controversy about women are not made for science, men are. This book, this story shows the lie to that. You know, a, a, a scientific problem does not care whether you are a man or a woman, black or white, old or young, all it cares about is can you wrap your mind around the problem and understand it. So even in today's world, we, we know that there are people who are not reaching their full potential. And if you're, so you gotta be careful with that and not assume that just because someone is a certain gender or race or age or whatever cannot understand something and contribute. We do have one question. Did she keep a journal by any chance at different points in her life? Did she? Is that the question? Yes. Did she keep a journal by any yeah. chance at different points in her life? Yes. Uh, she wrote a memoir, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation. Um, it's called The um, the Dyer's Hand. It's, it's actually very good. It's expensive. And there's hardly any copies out there. Um, not a lot of people have read it. I've read it. Uh, it was extremely well written, and it it was kind of the uh, blueprint for how to attack this story. Um, it's mentioned, um, it's footnoted, you know, many many times in the book. Um, but what it what happened is, I read the memoir, so I, I had kind of the gist of her story, and I did much more research on her to get the whole background of her discovery. But then as I, as I kept researching, I would come across different people. And every single one of them, whether they were famous like Rutherford or Eddington, or whether they were not famous, I researched who they were. So I could, I had enough information about all these different characters that I could weave them into the book uh, almost, in a, um, almost in a novelistic way. And that's what's made the books so much more than just, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not an astrophysics textbook, I assure you. Don't let the science uh, intimidate you. It, would be a, it could be useful in an astrophysics course, that's for sure. But it is really a, uh, a narrative about this woman's life with lots of colorful characters woven into it. I think there's a comment or a question, Pat. Do you see that? I do. Um, I would think that Lowell's portrait would have been taken down due to a sexistic determination, sexist determination, sorry. You know, you know what's happening? Is, this is interesting. Um, there is, of course, a house at Harvard called Lowell House. It's an undergraduate residence. And um, <clears throat> uh, a group of people have put together um, they, they, they've made another copy of that photograph uh, that, that um, hangs in the University Hall. And the plan was back in April, they were going to um, take Lowell's photograph down from <laughs> Lowell House and put Cecilia's up. Um, that didn't happen because of, you know, the pandemic and all, but that's still out there. And uh, I'm looking forward to the day when we can, when I can go up to Cambridge and be there for the dedication of that portrait in, of, of Cecilia's portrait in Lowell House. Donovan, can you uh, tell us about, because I made a comment to you after I finished the book that this has movie written all over it. Yeah. And your answer was? Well, uh, there is uh, a production company that um, I understand they, the paperwork is done. They're going to buy the rights, the film rights to the book. Um, I have a very good agent. Esther Newberg is her name. She lives in Sag Harbor. And um, <clears throat> she's with ICM in New York. And ICM has, of course, a Los Angeles office. And there's another agent out there. Uh, Josie Friedman is her name. She is the film to book agent. And I've been in touch with her. I haven't seen it yet, but she did write me an email saying the draft is in. So it looks promising. Um, it would be wonderful because it is a very cinematic story. And 
be great because it would, you know, it also be obviously good for the book, but, and I, and I don't mean that because it puts, you know, money in the author's pocket. I didn't really write it for that reason. What I really wanted is for people to read the book. Her story is an inspirational story and it deserves to be read and, and, and recognized. And that of course would help promote the book if they ever did a film. Yeah. So we shall see. Hollywood is notorious for optioning and then not doing anything, but we'll see. Are there any other uh, comments? Because uh, Donovan, do you want to um, mention if people want to buy this book? We asked oh, yes. how they could do it and I think you organized something. Yes. You know, I, I'll just make one last comment. You know, when I when I set out to write this book, I was not a, I was not a scientist, you know, I was not an historian. I, I, I was just a, just a writer looking for an idea. And so I didn't need to write it. It was, I wasn't under the gun of publisher parish or, or, you know, I wasn't an activist trying to push a cause. I was just this lowly writer looking for, <laughs> looking for a strong idea. But I think that lack of agenda, if you will, is what gives the book its power. It's, it's on one level, it is a well-researched biography. I, I can assure you, Harvard Press is, as I said, is you know, very meticulous about um, the books they publish. But on a whole other level, it's, it's about that basic human need to discover, to explain, to understand, to figure out. It's almost like the biography is a, is a vehicle for exploring that, that theme. So before I go to that slide, I'm going to... Oh, we, do, uh, we do have one question, which is, what is your next subject? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't have another uh, idea just yet. And so if anybody on this call has an idea, I would absolutely be thrilled to listen to it. Um, you know, it needs to be an idea that is I'd, I'd like it to follow the same guidelines, inspirational, colorful characters, interesting setting and period. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be about a woman. Somebody did ask that at the Harvard bookstore um, event, but, but it has to have those elements. And quite frankly, the, you know, the lives of women over history and even today, they bring those kinds of qualities with them. So that's, that's what made this book so, so compelling. Um, but I think if I'm, if I'm disciplined about what the next idea is, if you're, if you're tough on the idea, then, then the, book will, the, the book will almost write itself. That's what, that's what this one did. And that would be far better than me trying to force it by stringing words together. Um, I was going to read you just one quick quote from the book, okay? It's, it's, um, it's in the author's note. Some of you all know it. Some of you know it because you've read it already. But for those of you who haven't, um, this is really this is really good. I quote Richard Forte. He's a he's an English paleontologist. Uh, what is an English paleontologist? He really captured so eloquently that that uh, thrill of discovery that I'm talking about. Listen to this quote: "The excitement of discovery cannot be bought or faked." It is an emotion which must have developed from mankind's earliest days as a conscious animal, similar to the feeling when prey had successfully been stalked. It provokes a whoop of enthusiasm that can banish frozen fingers from consideration and make a long day too short. <laughs> don't, don't you just love that? Make a long day too short. That's, that's, that's who she was, you know, derided in class, told she was wrong, paid poorly, it didn't matter that she just stepped on all those obstacles in order to make her discovery because she was in the, in the hunt. And that's, that's really what, that's really what the book is about. Okay. Uh, should I go to that slide or is there no, one yeah. more? Question? Yeah. And then we'll, thank you. There is one comment and somebody yes. said, you seem to be drawn to compulsively curious characters. <laughs> yes. Well, she was a brilliant woman. I mean, I was drawn to her. I'm nowhere near as brilliant, that's for sure. I'm curious, and you do have to have a certain curiosity about you to want to read the book, no, no question. But man, she was into everything, not uh, stars, of course, but uh, soap making and 
cooking and sewing and she was an expert at, uh, on Renard the Fox. It was unbelievable all the things that she was into. So it was um, just a joy really to research and write. Okay, now let's see if this is gonna work. Mm. Yep, there it is. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, there's a, there are a lot of ways to buy the book, should you wish to buy it. Uh, so I'm not saying you have to do it yet on, with either one of these bookstores, but I made a deal with Southampton Books and their information is right there, info at SouthamptonSagHarborBooks.com and their phone number and Canio's, which is a bookstore in Sag Harbor, um, Canio's Books at Verizon.net. So I talked to both of them and I said, look, if if someone wishes to buy the book and they provide their name, you let me know and I will go into the bookstore and I will sign the book. And it's kind of fun to have a signed book. So, and that's what you normally do at, you know, these author events. So this is kind of a pandemic way, if you will, of getting a, getting a signed book. So um, their websites have all the information, Southampton Books or Canios. And they just happen to be near me in Watermelon. I can go and sign the book. But there, are, obviously, there are other, other ways to do it. Okay, I'll stop there. Bring you back. Well, Donovan, I'd like to say that, well, I'd say to everyone, there are a lot of reasons to buy this little book. I love it. It's, um, as Noel said, it's a, it's a readable book. It's about an important person. It'll just inspire you. And um, it's also wonderful to support not only libraries, but local bookstores. So I hope some of us will, will do that. Right. Um, Donovan, I think we're very fortunate that this woman's um, life's work landed in your field of curiosity. Because <laughs> you have uh, done this subject proud. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, it's been a, a real pleasure to work with you and to have you here this evening. So I think we all, maybe we can unmute ourselves and just clap and say, thank you very much, Donovan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.